Last week, I had the privilege and honor to begin a message series that I entitled uh, Burning Ones with You. And, and I want to kind of just recap a little bit uh, about that. Um, we were talking about the prophet Jeremiah. We were talking about how the Lord called him uh, into his ministry and how the Lord really just called him uh, into his purpose and, and into his calling in the Lord. And something that's so special about, you know, reading that story, it's just, I believe it should probably resonate with every single one of us that the moment that you heard the Lord call you out of darkness into light and when the Lord you know made that invitation to you when the Lord you know called you from the life of sin from the bondage from the things that you were dealing with in your time and in your day and you saw the Lord bring you into purpose you saw the Lord bring you into your identity and 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 it's a powerful thing when you have experienced that amen how many of you are, are happy to be able to serve God, amen? Like, that's a privilege, amen? Like, that is 100%, that is a privilege to serve God. You know, the Lord doesn't need anything from us, but he wants us, amen? He wants our heart, he wants our, our affection, he wants our devotion to him. He, he doesn't need us in the sense that, that, you know, God can't handle things on his own. Of course God can handle things on his own. But the beauty about the Lord is that he has entrusted the gospel with you and I. He's entrusted the word. He's entrusted his purposes to be fulfilled in the earth through you. That's a great commission. That is a great calling. That is a great responsibility. Amen? That is a, 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 a enormous task. And because of the enormity of it, because of the vastness of knowing that God is entrusting you and I as individuals, as the a, as a body of Christ, as a church, to preach the gospel, to teach the gospel, to lay hands on the sick, to cast out demons, to stand for righteousness. It sounds like a monumental task when you think of it on your own. But the beauty about the Lord is this, is that he never sends you into a battle that you are unequipped to win. He will never send you into something where it's like, you know what, I'm just going to leave you hanging and I hope you figure it out. But just like he did with David, just like he trained David in the wilderness with those, with those sheep, so God will train you in your season that you're living in now. But God will also prepare you. God will also empower you. He will give you the weapons that you need to fling at the giant so that the giant can fall. Amen? And that weapon is the word. Amen? That is prayer. That is worship. He's given us so many things that we can use in this season right here, right now, to continue to preach and teach the gospel. Amen? But we saw in Jeremiah's life, we saw that Jeremiah had ran into an issue that I believe every single one of us has run into at one time or another in your relationship with God, and that is feeling inadequate. That is feeling incapable of fulfilling what God wants you to do. For you and me, I believe that sometimes we think and we we, we want to say and look at our own, you know, matter. We want to look at our own self and say, well, God, these are the things that I do good. These are the things that I don't do good. And, and God, you know, hopefully, you know, uh, you'll be able to use that. And God doesn't look at the things the way that we do. God's not evaluating your life based on the talents you have. He's not evaluating your life based on the appearance that you have. He's not evaluating your life based on, you know, the, the, the things that you know how to do, the skills that, that you might have in this life. He's not looking at any of that. The Bible says that, that the outside appearance is, is not of, of concern to the Lord, but it's the heart. He's looking for someone that will trust in him. He's looking for somebody that will believe in him. Despite all the odds, despite what the world is saying, despite how the world is moving in such a, in such a massive, you know, it, it, I, I'm reminded of Matthew 7 where it says, you know, broad is the road that leads to destruction, right? There's a lot of people on that road right now. The big highway that's going to destruction, there's a lot of people there. But the Lord is looking for those that would be, that would find the narrow path, Right? And what does he say? The narrow path is the path of righteousness, the path of life. And he says only a few will find it. It's to say no to the patterns of this world and it's to say yes to God. 
Though it may look completely contrary to what the world wants you to think, it may be completely backwards in the world's eyes. It literally looks like foolishness to them. It's wisdom to God. And so the Lord is looking for people that I believe His Holy Spirit can empower, those, those that believe and trust and, and know the power of His Word that will stand in this time and in this generation as a burning one, as a person that is on fire for the Lord so that we can see the Great Commission continue to be fulfilled. Amen? How many of you love Jesus? Amen? You know that Jesus was never meant to be kept a secret. I remember years ago I heard this song and it, and it was talking about uh, the, the chorus of the song said, I don't want to be another camouflage soul. Camouflage is that thing that, you know, hunters use. I, I, I wear camouflage. My sister-in-law has a, the most ridiculous picture of me on her phone uh, as her, uh, what do you call those, you know, her little screensaver of me. Whenever I call, there's a picture of me and I'm completely wrapped. All you can see is like my eyes and the rest I'm covered in camouflage. I don't know why she has that picture of me on her phone, but it's hilarious. But camouflage is meant to do what? It is meant to hide you in your surroundings. It is meant so that you can go undetected in your surroundings. And so for me, being a hunter, you know, I don't want the, the animal that I'm hunting to see me. But I want to be blend in with the surroundings so that they don't know that I'm there. And as a Christian, we're not called to live that way at all. We're not called to blend in with our surroundings. We're not called to, to, to somehow just, you know, people could look at, uh, across the vast majority of people and, and not see a believer, not see a Christian. They, they, they're not supposed to, it's not supposed to be that way. They're supposed to be able to identify the light of Jesus in you. Last week I had them shut off all the lights and we turn on our cell phones and we, you know, turn on the lights so that everybody could see how powerful light actually is. Light is incredibly powerful. It was Albert Einstein that said that it's not darkness that pushes out light, but it's light that pushes out darkness. And Jesus said, I am the light of life. He is the one that has come to live and reside inside of your heart, to illuminate your life so that you can live passionately for him, so that others can see and know the Bible says that they can taste and see that the Lord is good. Because they see the evidence of a living, active, powerful God in your life. But if you're a camouflage soul, if you're an individual that blends in with the rest of the world, that nobody else can tell the difference, then is that the way that Jesus really wants you to live? I believe the Lord is looking for people that would be bold for him in these times and in these days that we're living in. Amen? We need the boldness of Daniel. We need the boldness of Peter. We need the boldness of Paul. That when literally their life was at stake, they said, I'm going to throw you into jail. I'm going I'm I'm to crucify you. I'm going to kill you. If you keep talking about this Jesus, they said, to jail I'll go. To the cross I'll go. My life is nothing. Paul uttered those words. He said, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I die for the cause of Christ, then it's been worth it all. I want to challenge us in our, in our life, in our thinking, in our beliefs, because sometimes we think we're really bold for Jesus. But when the rubber meets the road, when the, when the time actually comes for us to take a stand, will we stand? Will we stand? I love the verse in the book of Revelation that says that they did not even love their lives as, as so much to, to not be willing to give their lives for the Lord. In other words, their life, if that was what it cost to carry on the gospel then so be it their life they would give. I believe the Lord is looking for those kinds of people again in this day that we're living in. Amen? I want to continue to part two tonight. So if you have your Bibles, you can open them up to the first verses that we're going to be looking at in Isaiah chapter 63. Isaiah 63 verses 8 through 10. And I'll speak to you for just a minute before we get there. 
The second point that I want us to, to take note of tonight is this, is that in order to continue to be a generation that is burning passionately for the Lord, I believe that we need to hold fast to this next point that I'm going to give you. And it's very simple. It's stay unified with the Holy Spirit. I'll say that one more time. It's to stay unified with the Holy Spirit. This is your fuel. This is your life source. This is your empowerment when you are unified with the Holy Spirit. How many of you know how to follow instructions? Everybody raise your hand if you know how to follow instructions. Some of y'all didn't raise your hand. <laughs> I said raise your hand if you know how to follow instructions. Raise your hand. Okay, there. Now you proved to me that you know how to follow instructions, right? But let me ask you a question. Just because you have instructions doesn't mean that you will always follow them, correct? Just because you've been given an order, just because you've been given some instruction to follow, you've been given a command, it does not mean that you're automatically going to follow it. And so this is, the, this is true as well with the Holy Spirit. Many people treat the Holy Spirit as if he is their own personal genie. Now, how many of you know what a genie is? Uh, you all saw Aladdin or, or whatever that movie was. You know, genie is where you rub the little lamp and the, out pops this, this guy and he's like, hey, I'll give you three wishes, right? And you can choose whatever, you know, wish you want. You can, you can, you can wish to be the richest person in the world and you can rich, wish to have, you know, a, a huge house. And, you know, in my case, I would like, you know, really pretty green grass as far as the eye could see. That's one of my wishes, I guess. But people sometimes treat the Holy Spirit as if he's like a genie. You command, and he's supposed to move. You make your wish, you make your petition, you say, this is what I want, God, this is what I'm asking for, and you demand if the Holy Spirit would move. And so whenever they need wisdom or guidance or help or favor, they call out on the Holy Spirit and they cross their fingers and they hope for the best. But too often, the Lord and His Holy Spirit, they've become a last resort instead of a first responder for Christians. Too often, we're quicker to talk to people about it through text and through social media. We're, we're too you know, quick to you know, address it with a friend, a family member, maybe even a pastor. You say, oh, this is what I'm going through. And all along, the Holy Spirit's just waiting for your connection. He's just waiting for your communication. He's waiting to talk to you. How many of you know that heaven's solutions are, are, are better than any earthly answer that you can ever get? You could get the finest, you know, you could have the best friends that are godly people that, that love Jesus, that want to steer you in the right direction. But guess what? Even their advice will fall short of what the Holy Spirit will tell you to do. Amen? And so we want to not turn to God just in times of need, just in times of desperation, but we want to turn to the Lord for everything. And so sometimes I believe the Lord operates like this. We ask God for a fruit. We ask God for something tangible in your life. You say, God, Lord, I need this healing, God. God, I want to see this, this door open in my life so that I can continue my career. God, I want this blessing. And so we'll ask God for a fruit and blessing, but God gives you the seed. God's like, here you go. Here's the seed. Plant it. Water it. Take care of it. Nourish it. Protect it. Oh, but God, I want to be rich. God's like, here's the job application. Go to work every day. Manage your money well. Tithe. Do this, do this. We always want the end result, and God will always start us from the beginning. And so sometimes this is where we Refrain from turning to the Holy Spirit because I can get an answer quicker from my friend. I can get some random advice to follow by, by you know, posting a question on social media and somebody's like, yeah, you know, you should do this. Okay, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Sometimes we want the prosperity of God and he tells us to work diligently and not be lazy. The Lord said, he said, give and it shall be given back to you. He said, the least shall become the greatest. And so unless you remain in him, we can ask according to his will. But if we think we can do as we please and live for our own will or our own desires, then I believe we can offend the Holy Spirit. The Lord is pleased by our obedience. He said, if you love me, you will obey what I command. True love for God looks like obedience to him. 
True love for God is not simply saying you love him. That's easy, right? A husband, a wife, we can, you can say you love each other all you want. But it's the actions that mean more, right? It's the faithfulness. It's the trust. It's the relationships. It's walking through the fire together. It's all of those things that make that relationship work. And so I want to warn us tonight and say this, that we need to be very, very careful in the times that we are living in, to not disobey the Holy Spirit. I meet people all the time. They say, you know what, Pastor? I, I, I felt like I needed to say this. Why didn't you say it? I, I didn't know if I should. He told you to say it. You don't need my permission to say it. If he told you to say it, by all means. But the enemy will always try to come into those moments where you are questioning, did God really say it? And you hear loud and clear. You know it's the voice of the Lord. You know it's your father's voice. He gave you clear instruction. He said, this is what I'm asking you to do. I want you to pray for this person. I want you to go there. I want you to give this. I want you to bless somebody that way. I want you to whatever. And all of a sudden you're going like, uh, I don't know. I think I'm supposed to do that. All the time people tell me, you know what, I, you know, right after this happened in the service, you know, I just really felt this and I, I felt like God wanted me to say this or share that. And I'm going like, and you didn't because, well, I, I, I don't know. Obey the Holy Spirit. Obey the Lord. Amen. Obey the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 63 and verse 8. Let's read this. He says, surely they are my people, sons who will not be false to me. And so he became their savior. In all their distress, he too was distressed. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and his mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and he carried them all of the days of old. And yet they rebelled and they grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned and he became their enemy and he himself fought against them. If you've ever felt like your relationship with the Lord has been a challenge, it could be because you have disobeyed God and the Lord has drawn away. And when the Lord draws away, trust me, it's going to get really difficult to handle it. It's going to get really challenging to, to bear the burdens. It's going to get really challenging to think you've got all the wisdom that you need. It's going to get really, really difficult to think that somehow you can handle it on your own. One of my favorite verses, it's like a life verse for me. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. What does the Bible say? In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths, right? But it talks about doing this one critical thing. It says, do not lean on your own understanding. If I lean on my own understanding, it, that is to use my understanding, my wisdom, my thoughts, my, my goodness, you know, my conscience, my intentions. If I lean on that as a pillar of something that is of substance that I can somehow keep building my relationship with God on, I will fall. The Bible says that the house that was built on, on sand was blown away when the storms and the wind came. Unless you are obeying the Holy Spirit, unless you are listening to the last word of instruction that he had given you, then leaning on your own understanding is going to get you in trouble. Amen? It's going to get you in a place where you're having a challenge in your life. And so when the people rebelled and they grieved the Holy Spirit, God always disciplined them. I love this. In verse, uh, in verse 9, it talks about, where is it? I'm sorry. In verse 9, it talks about him being a loving father. He became their savior. It talks about, uh, in verse 8, he said they, will, they are sons to him. And so when we see that in their disobedience, he disciplined them as a father would discipline a child. Now, I can thank God for that, and you should be able to thank God for that, that he doesn't discipline us sometimes as just righteous God. Because if he disciplined us that way, then guess what? All of us would be in trouble. <laughs> If he disciplined us as a judge, if he disciplined us as somebody that was simply just saying, you are not qualified, you are not righteous, you are not holy, then guess what? We don't stand a chance. 
But the beautiful thing about this is that the Lord looks at us as a father. And though his hand of discipline can be strong, it appeared at, at that point to them as though God himself was their enemy and he was fighting against them. But contrary to that appearance, he was discipline, disciplining his people because he wanted to arouse them to correct their behavior. When the Lord rebukes you, when the Lord chastises you, when the Lord disciplines your life, he does it as a loving father. He doesn't do it to shame you. He doesn't do it to, you know, you know, make you, you know, all of a sudden feel like, oh, you're unworthy. You can't serve him. No, he does it as a loving father. How many of you are grateful for your parents? Amen. How many of you are thankful for the parents the Lord's given you in your, in your life? Sometimes your parents have had to do the most challenging things to look at a son or a daughter and say, I'm sorry, son, but. This is unacceptable what you're doing, what you're saying, where you're going. I'm sorry, daughter, the, the, the behavior that you have, the attitude that you have, the way that you speak, you know, this is unacceptable. You know that it's just as challenging for a parent to discipline a child as it is a child to receive the discipline? It is. It's absolutely the same thing. And I believe it's the Lord's heart. The Lord is, would rather shower you with blessings forevermore. But listen, there's those times where he has to step in as a loving father and correct you. He has to step in as a loving father to bring you back in so that that branch that was growing wayward can be pruned and it can grow fruit. He wants you to bear fruit for him. And so the Lord wants his people, his children, and everyone to be unified with him. Not in, a, not in a controlling way, but as a father to his sons and daughters. Amen? And so we need to live as the Spirit desires us to live. Not only for his purposes, but for our benefit. Let's read out of Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65 and verse 1. It says, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. He said, I was found by those who did not seek me. It said, to a nation that did not call on my name, I said, here I am, here am I. And it says, all the day long I've held out my hands to an obstinate people who walk in ways that are not good, pursuing their own imaginations. Nehemiah chapter 9, listen to this, uh, verse 17, it said, they have turned a deaf ear. I'm reading out of the message translation. Might read a little different on the screen. It says, but they turned a deaf ear. They refused to remember the miracles that you had done for them. They turned stubborn. They got it into their heads to return to their Egyptian slavery. And it says, and you, a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, incredibly patient with a lot of love, you did not dump them. The NIV at the end, it reads that God did not desert them. In our disobedience, God did not desert us. Amen? Amen. In our unfaithfulness to God, in our rebellion towards God, the Lord didn't say, you know what, forget them. I, I'm going to go create another people that are going to be holy and righteous. No, he didn't do that to us. He did not throw us away. But he came in those places in our life so that we could understand that even in our stubbornness, even in our rebellion, even in our unfaithfulness, that he still loves us. Even in the times when you didn't want to listen, even in the times when you did not want to obey, he still loves you. Psalms verse 78, chapter 78, verse 56 says this, but they kept on giving him a hard time. They rebelled against God, against the high God, and they refused to do anything that he told them. It's incredible because every single one of us have been in those shoes. The Holy Spirit said, the Lord gave the command. The word told you what to do. John 15, John 15 verse 16 is so humbling to me. It's so humbling to every single one of us because it says this. It said, you did not choose me. I chose you. That is an incredibly humbling reminder to say that we don't deserve to stand where we stand today. We don't deserve to have the grace and the mercy of God in our life today. We have not earned it by all the times we came to church. We have not earned it by all the times that we sang the song. You did not choose me. I chose you, God says. And I appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that would last. So that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. 
It is because of Jesus, 1,000%, that you are here today. Can everyone say amen tonight? And it's because of his mercy, his grace, his faithfulness, his forgiveness, his love, and his purpose from, for your life that you exist today. Even in their rebellion, the Israelites, they, they, the Lord sought after them. How many of you have ever had to chase down a person that's mad? <laughs> Don't raise your hand or whatever, but just, you know, you, you know, you, you, you somebody, somebody was mad, you know, and they were angry and, and, you know, you were trying to be the peacemaker. You were trying to be the person like, no, 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 it's okay. You know, come on, you know, come play with us, you know, on the playground or whatever it was that, you know, you were chasing the person down for. And the person that's mad probably doesn't, really realize their action in the moment and maybe they don't realize that somebody's even chasing them but believe it or not they want to be chased they want somebody to reel them back in they want to feel the love they want to feel the embrace they want to feel the closeness because for whatever reason whatever made them upset caused them to run but when there is somebody that would go after them as that lifesaver, as that person of mercy, as that compassionate one that says, hey, listen, I noticed you were off over here. I noticed that you were hurt. I noticed that you were offended. Listen, I, I went out of my way for you. It's so beautiful how the Lord does that in our life. How the Lord continually in our rebellion, in the times that we don't respond, in the times that we're not faithful to him, he still seeks after us, church. He still seeks after you. Just like the one that got out of the pen, he will leave the 99 to go after you because he loves you and he's merciful and he doesn't want you to miss the mark. He doesn't want you to miss out on the purpose and the plan that he has for your life. I remember years ago, I, I was teaching a message and, and uh, there was an illustration that I had shared and it was something like this. It was talking about, you know, the blessings of God and, and it was talking about how, you know, if you miss out on the purpose of God, you know, what would that look like? And and there was this young man and he got to heaven and, you know, he, he you know, gets to heaven and, and he's there in the presence of God. And, you know, he's got this little tiny mansion that he gets to go into and he sees this huge, long, just line of like gifts and blessings and things. And he's like, man, you know, what is that? And he asked one of the angels or he asked somebody, I don't remember how the story went, but he asked one of the angels and he asked him like, well, what is all those things over there? He's like. Well, those are all the blessings that you missed out on. All the times that you didn't trust God. All the times that you didn't say yes to God. All the times, all those things were yours. All those things were already in the hand of God. They were ready to be yours. But because you rebelled, because you didn't believe, because you didn't trust, well, they just stayed there. And dare I say that it would even be that way in your life tonight, that if you haven't obeyed God, you're missing out on something that the Lord wants to give you. But the Lord is not going to move you past your last step of disobedience. You think God's going to give you another list of things to do and say, oh, you know what, now I'm telling you to do this when you didn't obey the last thing that he gave you. Amen? Does that, is this making sense to anyone tonight? So this is where the Lord is looking at you and he's saying, be faithful. Be faithful. If you love me, you'll obey me. He sought after the, after the Israelites, even in their wickedness and in their double-minded lifestyle, he still showed patience and compassion. I'm so thankful that God loves us like a father. Amen? How many of you are thankful for that tonight? And so we see that these people, they were not in step with the Holy Spirit, but they were challenging the Holy Spirit, just like a child challenges a parent. God's people, when living in the flesh, they challenge the Holy Spirit. That is how to react to somebody's words, how to handle anger, how to deal with emotions, how to avoid sin. Your flesh is in a constant battle. Amen? Romans chapter 7, uh, verse 17 says this, 
As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is the sin living in me. He said, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature or the flesh. He said, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. In your flesh, you have the desire to do what is good, but you cannot carry it out. This is why the Lord is asking you to be unified with the Holy Spirit. Galatians 6 and 8 says, whoever sows, that is plant. When you sow, you're planting. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows, though, to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. So the Lord is looking for our obedience, amen? The Lord is looking that every single day you would wake up and you would crucify the flesh. You would say no to the emotions, no to the reactions, no to the responses that your flesh would want to give, and yes to what the Holy Spirit wants you to do. Yes to the way the Lord wants you to live. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 24. Those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And so God's Holy Spirit has been given to us for a purpose, to live life as Christ would have us live it. And so what is that purpose? Let me share a few things with you tonight. Number one is this, is to share the gospel with this world. It's very simple. It's to share the gospel with this world. Matthew 28, verse 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Is that a command? Yes. <laughs> it's not an option. It is a command. This is part of your purpose in Christ. It goes on to say, he said, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Acts chapter 1 and verse 7 says this, He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates that the Father has set by his own authority. But in verse 8, he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is part of your purpose in this life. You to be a witness for the kingdom of God. Amen. When the Holy Spirit comes upon your life, you will be a witness for him. I see people struggle with being a witness, and then I have to wonder, is the Holy Spirit in your life? Is the Holy Spirit really living in your life? Are you offending the Holy Spirit that he's not in your life, but are you living to please the Spirit? If you are, he's in your life, and you'll be a witness. It comes as part of the package. Do you see where I'm going tonight? The second thing is this, is the purpose is to follow the leading of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1 says this, Follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now, I could stop there because that sounds really nice. Oh, the Lord wants us to walk in love. This is what he's asking of us. But let's keep going. Verse 3. But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Talk about a standard that's been set. Amen? Talk about a standard that the Lord is looking for you and I to, to see. I need to say this. We need to raise the standards and the banner of holiness back in the church today. Amen? Amen? I'll say that one more time. We need to raise the standards and the banner of holiness back in the church today. It used to be, man, that if you had an impure thought, you wouldn't even set foot on this altar. It used to be if you had a grievance against somebody that you would walk out of your way to go and make peace with them. It used to be that if you were offended in your life and in your heart that you could actually walk up to the individual and say, hey, listen, you hurt me. There's something that, that happened in our life. But listen, I want to be right before God. So we need forgiveness here. We need to make peace with this thing. We need to bury the hatchet. We need to come back into communion with one another because we're brothers and sisters in Christ. 
It used to be that there was a standard of holiness. That there was a standard of holiness that we wouldn't look like the world, but guess what? We would look like Jesus. And so there's a lot of things that I believe that the church needs today that somehow have been glossed over, have been lost and forgotten. The scripture is telling us that we need to be known by our love for one another, but we also need to live lives that are set apart from this perverted and immoral culture that we're living in if we want to inherit the kingdom of God. That was a good time to say amen. Too late. Too late, you missed it. Number three. His purpose for us is to protect the gospel and to stand for truth. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 says, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God which he bought with his own blood. I believe the Lord is wanting you and I to be people that stand on truth and for truth in these times that we're living in. I said it before and I'll say it again. Sometimes we think that we're just supposed to love people. And you know what? It starts there. It starts with loving uh, this world as Christ loves the world and died and gave himself up for them. Make no mistake about it. You can't share the truth without love. But you cannot love somebody and enable their behavior and never share the truth and watch them just wander and walk all the way themselves to hell. There is a war zone that is attacking truth in this time that we are living in. I'll say it one more time. We are living in a war zone where truth, absolute truth, everybody, this is the absolute truth. One more time. This is the absolute truth. You can't tear a page out of it and think that you can omit it to become what you want it to say. It is all the truth. And in this season that we're living in, there is a war against that truth, against what it says. Because we live in a culture of acceptance. We live in a culture of tolerance. We live in a culture where we're supposed to be okay with certain things. But just because people differ from us means that we have to accept it. No, we don't. We have the truth. The truth has been written. I didn't write it. God wrote it. God set the standard for you and I. God set the standard for this world. And we have to get back to that place where we understand that we can actually engage in culture and stand for righteousness. Don't be afraid of what the world's going to say to you. They don't like you anyways. Amen. Jesus said what? He said, they hated me. They're going to hate you also. They persecuted me. They're going to persecute you also. We have to engage in standing for righteousness. And we must not allow culture to conform us to the world, but rather keep preaching the full gospel so that hearts can come to repentance. If you do not preach and live and teach the full gospel, nobody's going to repent. But when you live that way, when you live by the standard of righteousness, it causes people to see inward and it causes them to see how defiled they are and how loving God is by sending his son to die for their sins. You see, the world cannot know the person of truth, that is Jesus, unless they've heard the word of truth. Truth is what sets us and the world free. Amen. And so his purpose is for us is to know Christ. How many of you know Jesus? Amen. Whew, I'm glad that I know Jesus. I'm so glad that I know Jesus. Man, I was a super lost young man. I guarantee that I would not be standing here today if I had not had an encounter with Jesus Christ. I would be completely lost. I would be completely hell bound and bound in sin. But I thank God for Jesus. And his purpose for you is to know him. He wants you to know him intimately. He wants you to know him passionately, church. He wants you to know him. He wants you to go to that secret place where no one else can go but you and him. He wants to know you in that manner. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says, We have not received the spirit of the world. He said, But we've received the spirit who is from God that we may understand what God has freely given us. 
This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. I love this, but it says right there, it says, He has not given us the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. Sometimes, as believers and as Christians, we can forget We can forget because we've been so blessed basking in the presence of God. We've been so blessed being able to, you know, experience God and encounter God. But sometimes we forget what we really possess. Sometimes we really forget what we, what he has afforded us. The mercy that we have in our life, the grace that we have in our life, the power and the authority that we have in our life. Sometimes we actually forget that. And here, I love what the word says. It says that we may understand what he's freely given us. That that is that we may see and know exactly what it is that he paid and died to give you. When you realize what it is that you have, when you realize the responsibility of what it is that you carry in your life, it changes everything. It 100% changes everything. Because you know all of a sudden that you were bought with a price. And this body, this temple is not your own. You can't do or say with it. You can't mutilate it. You can't do things with it that you think you should be able to do. Because you were bought with the blood of Jesus. We owe him everything, church. We owe him absolutely everything. We owe him our life to know him. We know a lot of stuff. I know you're smart. Everybody in here is smarter than me. We know a lot of things. But if we could look at our life and our mind and our heart and our inside, our being, like we look at our phones and our computers, they all have a certain amount of storage space, right? I got the 256, I think it is right here. If you look at the amount of storage space that you have and you actually consider How much of it is being filled up with the word of God? You know how you see that little graph? (laughs) And it shows all the different colors and it says these are your pictures and your videos. And and this is your, you know, the data from your social media. This is your whatever, whatever, whatever. If you could actually see a breakdown of what exists in your heart. What percent is Jesus taking up? What percent is the Holy Spirit taking up? Is the whole thing one color because it's all him? Or is he just a little line in the pie chart? The beauty about the Lord is this, is that inside of our finite minds, you cannot contain all that he is. So every single day you could learn about him, you could learn about his spirit. His spirit can reveal more and more truth to your life and you'll never be full. You can't contain all of him. But he wants you to know him, amen? Amen. And finally, he wants us to inherit his kingdom. One glorious day, and I say glorious day, one glorious day, we will inherit the kingdom of God. We will finally go to that place. We will finally behold the one who gave his life for us. We will finally be in the perfect presence of of holiness and truth. We'll finally be in the perfect presence where there is No imperfection. There's no sickness. There's no disease. There's no hatred. There's no division. There's none of those things exist in heaven. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50 says, I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. He says, listen, I tell you a mystery. He said, we will not all sleep. He said, "But but we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. Verse 54. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true that death has been swallowed up in victory. See, we're talking about having unity with the Holy Spirit tonight. You see, a generation that is unified with the Holy Spirit is a generation that will burn brightly for Jesus and lead many, many people to Christ. 
They will be those who fulfill his plan and will for their lives. A Holy Spirit burning generation will not be consumed in the flames of hell, but it will burn with the refiner's fire in its life. Amen.